The 2023 season is right around the corner, but who will be the new stars? Lindsey Crosby of Locked On MLB Prospects stops by on this episode of Locked On MLB. You are Locked On MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, baseball fans, and welcome to a Locked On MLB, Locked On MLB Prospects crossover. This is the podcast. We talk about either Major League Baseball of today and yesterday or the MLB of tomorrow. You figure out which one is which on the Locked On Podcast Network, where it is your team every day. I am your host of the Locked On MLB, Paul Francis Sullivan. If you don't believe me, Look at my lower third. Why would it lie to you? You can call me Sully. I am an Emmy-nominated television producer who has been a baseball podcaster for over a decade, and I'm about to start my fifth season here at the Locked On MLB. Well, as host of the Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Follow us at Locked On MLB Pods on Twitter or on Instagram. You can follow me. I'm your pal Sully. I'm at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel as we're trying to get one billion followers crossing over with me right here is this Baja Kaloop who is the host of Locked On MLB Prospects mystery guest sign in please I am Lindsey Crosby obviously host of Locked On MLB Prospects going on season two as captain of this uh this prospect ship you can follow me on Twitter at Crosby Baseball shows on Twitter at Locked On Farm Locked On MLB Prospects wherever you get your podcasts YouTube all of that good stuff thank you for being here Thank you. And that's our show. Thanks for listening. Um, <laughs> hey, uh, Lindsay, we're doing a crossover here because this is spring training. Uh, spring training games are starting in just a few days, which means we're going to have the World Baseball Classic, which means we'll soon have the beginning of the year. And we'll see which prospects are going to become real life Major League Baseball players and not just prospects. You know, I, I remember when I first got into reading about minor league baseball was in the late eighties. I discovered baseball America. And I'm telling you, I always bought every prospect hook, line and sinker. Every player coming up was going to be, you know, the Kirk Dressendorf or the Glenn Allen Hill was going to own major league baseball. We're living in the Sil Camposano universe. Um, You know, uh, you know, there was a, Anytime anyone got picked early, I'm in. Let's go. Tyler Houston, rehearse your Hall of Fame speech. There are many, many times the Matt Laportas of the world are huge prospects who then don't add, don't make their uh, – don't meet where we thought they were going to wind up. And yet this is the time of year when you know some of those players will. And there will be some players who will catch you by surprise. And this is one of the really fun parts I always found about spring training is when you take some of those prospects that you've heard about and you heard mumble about, especially if you follow a show hosted by Lindsey Crosby uh, called the Locked On MLB Prospects Show, where he's an encyclopedia of baseball prospects. This is when you get to see him for the first time interact with the other major leaguers. And some of them will get sent back down. But for at least a few days, you start to see them intermingle and you see the seeds being planted. And I think that this is an exciting part of the year. Uh, I think especially for you who spend so much time analyzing these young prospects and trying to figure out which ones are going to be the next big one. Yeah, like I'm not going to lie. When a young like a 19 or 20-year-old prospect gets a non-roster invitee spot at Major League Spring Training, it's a pretty good signal to people like me that like, yeah, they really like him. They think he's going to be a big leaguer one day. They want him up. Like Jackson Merrill is 19 years old and he's in big league camp right now. It's yeah. kind of ridiculous, but it tells me that no, they legitimately think he could be the best prospect in baseball at the end of 2023. And so uh, this is kind of this is I'm not going to say this is our Super Bowl because the draft is our Super Bowl, but this is like a big a big time of the year for us because we can kind of find out. Okay, here are the brand new guys that these teams love, and then. Here are the guys that we've seen in double A AA and triple A and 
they're they're trying to win a roster spot. Some of them will, and that's the, that's the coolest thing is MLB has incentivized these teams to uh, promote these players early and let them compete so that they can get uh, a draft pick if this player comes in first or second rookie of the year, and that's what I love. I love that too, and I love anything that incentivizes having your best players on the major league roster instead what of saying, a wild concept. Oh, well, you know what? They need a little more seasoning, roughly five weeks of seasoning in AAA before we bring them up. Hey, I wasn't planning on doing this, but I just thought of this. Um, 2008 was 15 years ago. And the top 10 prospects, uh, according to MLB.com, were Adam Miller, uh, Homer Bailey, Andrew McCutcheon, Colby Rasmus, Clay Buckholtz, Jabba Chamberlain, Clayton Kershaw, Cameron Maben, Evan Longoria, and the number one prospect was Jay Bruce. Wow. And a smattering of, you know, all-stars like Wade, you know, Wade Davis, David Price, Jacoby Ellsbury, Rick Porcello, Brandon Wood, some sad stories like, of course, the, the late Nick Adenhart and the likes of the Jake McGee, a lot of Jake McGee's, a lot of Matt Antonelli's. It's funny when you look at that top 10, some of them, like, Kershaw's going to the Hall of Fame. Yeah, there's McCutcheon's still legit, playing. Yeah, there's still some legitimate all stars. Then there's some who had were okay. You know, Kobe Rasmus had some good years. Never was a superstar. They thought he was going to be. Um, you know, Buckholtz was great when he was healthy, but he always got hurt. And Adam Miller is in the middle of that. You know, I mean, it's you know, it's interesting to look back to see how many times, you know, they've landed. You go, you scroll down this list here. They have the top 50 of which, uh, you know, you have Dexter Fowler was number 50 and Rod Hamas Lees was number 45. I have no idea who that is. I've never said that name before in my life, but you know, Max Scherzer is number 35 behind Chris Marrero. You know, so sometimes you... It's not an exact science. It's not an exact science, but it's part of the great thrill of this time of year. When you see, you know, I, I've always been guilty of this. Hey, they they hit 35 home runs in double A. That means they're going to hit 40 home runs in the major leagues. And there are some times a player catches you off guard and becomes, you know, a, a, a great player when they were a somewhat unheralded free uh, uh, minor leaguer and prospect. But, you know, this is this is... You know, the cliche of, you know, every, all the teams are 0-0. Zero, zero, every team has a shot. And now that they've – I know we've made fun of this, and you made a joke about it. I made a joke about it. But we lived in a world for many years where the incentive was to not bring your best players up. And when you saw the likes of, for example, when Jason Hayward got the call um, to make it in, in out of uh, camp to go to the Braves in 2010, people were a bit startled. You know, sometimes it's, it's so egregious. Like what happened with Chris Bryant? Like what happened with David Price? That they're they're trying to the, the ideas of those of you to understand that if they kept them in the minor leagues long enough, it meant that their free agent clock would be held back an entire year, and so they got one more year before they became a free agent. But I'll tell you another thing. We'll get to some of the process in a second. But I think one of the things that is making that whole notion, that whole nonsense of shoving your best prospects into the minor leagues longer than they need to be, is the fact you're seeing teams sign some of these players, buying out some of their arbitration years into their free agent years, because the team is basically saying, hey, we're going to invest in you, and we're better off overpaying you before we have to, and having it be team-friendly later in the contract, and therefore getting the bulk of your best years. And when you saw this, like Tampa Bay did this with um um, why am I why am I why am I blanking on his Wanda name? Wander Franco. Franco. I kept I I, I before I, he was, even debuted. Before he even ahead. debuted. Yeah. Because they say, hey, we believe that you're going to be good for a while, so we're better off paying you now. And if and and you know if this bet doesn't go off, then fine. Uh, you know, we'll be paying too much later. But at the same time, I think that it, one of the things I like about that other than the fact that it eliminates arbitration for some of these young stars, so we don't have to have that contention, it also means we don't have to play this stupid game, the, yeah, the like, dance. If your guy is a good prospect, which theoretically, I mean, obviously, you're not going to bring a couple of guys who's bad, 
But if he is good enough, then being in the top three finishers for rookie of the year will get your team additional draft picks. And then what I like is, and I think what people don't talk about when they talk about that provision is the other side of that. If you finish first or second in rookie of the year, no matter when you were called up, if you're in the top 100 prospects, you get a year of service time. So if somebody is so incredibly good that you can right. you can hold them back until May or June and they can still be one of the top two vote getters for rookie of the year in their um in their league, they get the draft pick compensation or they get the service time anyway. Good. And so at at that point, just have them up on opening day. Don't hold your team back by not having them part of the roster for six weeks or eight weeks. And so last year we saw more prospects, I think, than ever make the Good. make make the teams on opening day, and that's how it should be. They should be in there introduced when the big crowd is there, you know. And and the other thing is, and this is another. I know this is startling to think about some of these things. If you bring up one of these young players, and it turns out they're not ready, then you do send them back. You know what? It you know some players may not be 100% ready or some players you might say, do you know what? This is going to have a negative impact on them. And so let's not do that. But still, I mean, like I remember the, 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 was it the, uh, was it the GM or someone of, of Seattle was bragging about the fact that they hold back their players. And I said, how's that been working out for you? The only franchise that's never made it to the World Series at the time they were in the middle of a 20 year playoff drought. How's that working out for you? Has that been a good plan? Is it helping the product on the field? Well, look at last year. They they promote Julio Rodriguez on opening day. He wins rookie of the year and they break the 19 or 20 year uh, playoff drought. And then Jerry DePoto, the general manager, comes on to Locked On Mariners. Uh, and talks about it. And so I think what we're learning is um, the Locked On Podcast Network, if you promise to come on our shows, your prospects will win Rookie of the Year. That's what we're saying. That's what we're saying. And we're also saying it's really great when these teams say, hey, do you know what? You're not just a prospect. We're going to put our money behind you. We're betting on you. We think you're a good bet. Now, when you talk about good bets, we like to think about FanDuel. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and it's now the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's right. The bonus bet's back if your first bet doesn't win. And just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on anything from the money line to point scores to threes drained. Plus, FanDuel lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. Parlez-vous FanDuel? Oui, je parle FanDuel. So don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. That's FanDuel.com. Slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the National Basketball Association. All right, Lindsey Crosby, Sully, we're here doing a locked on MLB, locked on uh, MLB prospects. I almost said locked on Diamondbacks. I'm so used to having Millard on the show. Um, let's can the balloon juice and get right down to who we think are the. Uh, the top picks to be the rookie of the year in 2023. And I understand you're going to be going to FanDuel. By the way, have you downloaded FanDuel? I hear they have a new uh, first bet, no bets, fear sweat. Um, what is it again? The, the no sweat no, first bet. I should no know our copy. Bet. I have heard that the app is safe, secure, and super easy to use. And so yeah. I went to FanDuel to get the American League rookie of the year odds to kind of look at, uh, who are the favorites in the American League? I've ne- there's a couple, four or five players here that I want to get like both of us, our thoughts on these guys and how they'll do. The number one, like the best odds in the American League, almost by far, is Orioles shortstop Gunnar Henderson. Number right. one prospect in all of baseball, pretty unanimous across Baseball America, Fangrass, uh, MLB Pipeline, all of that. But uh, 
2019 second rounder out of high school. I uh, got a little bit of time in the majors last year, 34 games. I like teams that call a guy up late like this. Yeah. You get a taste of the big leagues. You see how your offense does against big league pitching, and you have all offseason to work on it. 259, 348, 440. He hit well. He played well. He's going to be either at shortstop or third base this year. Uh, how do you feel about this Baltimore Orioles team this year? Well, first of all, I got to say, one reason I like it when they, they call him up is, first of all, it gives fans a little taste that sometimes at the end of the year to be like, here's a, here's a preview of coming attractions. And also it makes a lot of the promo materials a little cleaner when they have actual pictures of them in a major league game, as opposed to them yeah, wearing their Worcester Red Sox uniform or yeah. something like that. Here's this guy uh, in Bowie or no, or right. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Here, here's, here's, our, the, here's our hope. Here's uh Delmarva Shorebird Gunner Henderson. Yeah. You can yeah. Get, like, here's it, Baltimore Oriole Gunner Henderson. Right. It's very, two very, two very different things. Um, I think with the 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 Orioles are a strange situation for their fan base right now. For the first time since um, uh, Buck Showalter decided not to use his best reliever in a wild card game, they were relevant. They had a winning season. They were fun to watch. And Baltimore is not a good baseball city. When they're good, they're a great baseball city with tremendous passion and great history and great tradition from when the St. Louis Browns moved there. And they have a great baseball tradition going back to the point that it's the birthplace of play people like Babe Ruth and John McGraw. It's There's tremendous, when you look at the, the years where they played in old Memorial Stadium, this Baltimore is dying to have a new great team. Mm -hmm. And they, I think they felt cheated by the team in the mid-90s that, that came up short in back-to-back -back years in the ALCS. They, the team that was good in the early 2010s, that 2014 team sure looked like they were going to the World Series, especially after the Anaheim was eliminated. But mm -hmm. they ran into that weird buzzsaw of late-inning comebacks by the Kansas City Royals. So there was such enthusiasm when Adley Rushman came up and there's and they started playing really well. They shot past the Red Sox. They they wound up finishing above 500. And they've had what I think is a, nothing short of a disastrous offseason, which is not only did they not make any really big, I mean, Kyle Gibson, a couple other people, but like really true additions. There was still a bitter taste in their mouth that they were trading away players at the deadline, like Mancini. Mm -hmm. um, but also, the ownership starts putting their foot in their mouth, and now people are wondering, are they going to move to Nashville? <laughs> because what they want, the Orioles are dying to move out of their stadium and move into a Camden Yards-like ballpark in Baltimore. Oh, wait, they're already <laughs> in Camden Yards. What are you doing? So I think the thing that brings back hope to the good people of Baltimore and, uh, you know, that, that's probably the best thing to happen to Baltimore since the wire has been the fact that you have these young prospects who give them legitimate hope. And Gunnar Henderson is seems to be the heads and shoulders, the best prospect in the American League mm -hmm. and looks like that surefire bet to be the rookie of the year. We've done the ad read already. Um, I think that what they're hoping for is that he goes along and helps create this new nucleus that will make Baltimore, you know, a, a fund. And then you could, you know, if the Red Sox, who lets me forget are only two years removed from being in game six of the LCS, that could be an unbelievably competitive division if the Red Sox ever got their act together. But I think it's great. Whenever you see a dormant team, like the way San Diego was dormant, like the way Philadelphia was dormant, like the way that Seattle was dormant, the fan base wakes up. It's like the first time a generation has, has fun with the team. And Gunnar Henderson should be one of the people to, you know, lead the way. But I want to ask you a question, Lindsay. How okay. often is it when you have the consensus pick, the heads and shoulders best prospect, how often does that player go on to be the rookie of the year? I The example I remember specifically was when Greg, when I was a teen, Greg Jeffries was going to be the god of New York baseball, was the best prospect anyone had ever seen and was a, a, the biggest surefire bet to win the Rookie of the Year. And he wound up being good. But not Rookie but, of the Year. But not Jerome Walton good, who won the Rookie of the Year that year with the uh, Chicago Cubs. 
I feel like all too often it doesn't line up for that player to be up in the year for enough time to win rookie of the year. There's always somebody behind him who comes up early. You've had so much service time manipulation and things like that, that it's hard to go to a ton of like a lot of other instances where that number one guy has come up and just wire to wire been the rookie of the year. Uh, while we're on rookie of the year, like I want to get your opinion on this. The number three guy on this list is Red Sox outfielder Matsutake Yoshida. And it's an interesting scenario for a lot of people because he's not a traditional rookie. He's been a professional baseball player just in Japan. Right. Uh, are, do, are you of the opinion that somebody who has been a professional baseball player in a, different, in a foreign league should be considered a prospect and should be considered rookie of the year eligible? It's a great question because I also think the same thing could be true of someone coming from like the Cuban national team, which is a which is not the same level as a high school or a college team. Right. I've always had a strange feeling about this, especially, you know, when Nomo was the first one. And mm -hmm. I think Nomo is an underrated uh, pioneer in baseball that he sort of kicked open the doors for a lot of Japanese players and obviously Ichiro was the first to be a uh, an offense superstar, Lonely and that trip. led to uh, the you know, the arrival of many other you know great players, especially Hideki Matsui. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when Leo Matsui Tani. was uh, when Matsui was he didn't win Rookie of the Year in um, in two thousand three. The, the legendary Angel Baroa did, um, and I remember I think it felt weird because. Matsui was such a gigantic star already. Ichiro was already such a gigantic star. It feels like there almost has to be another category. It's like they, they, they've gone from a level... The rookie implies that this is the first year that you are playing amongst this level of talent. Mm -hmm. And I think they're... And I think we have to include them in rookie of the year because the definition is their first year in the major leagues and the major leagues is the highest level of play in the world. So I, I, I suppose we have to continue doing that, but it does feel, it feels different than like, I'm going to use just someone who will like, like, you know, um, when someone who is a, a, a big college prospect, like, you know, a Verlander or someone who was, you know, Shohei Otani won the rookie of the year. That feels a little weird. Not that yeah. he didn't deserve it, but he was already playing at a high level. But then again, that's how the the rules of rookie of the year land. I, I would understand it if there was a rule change to that to a degree. Um, but uh, it does it does always feel a little bit a little bit strange when someone's already played at a super high level, um, and you know, the first year Otani, first year. Matsui, yeah. first year Nomo or whatnot. Like, um, or the same thing when Jose Abreu won rookie of the year with the Chicago White Sox. He was already playing on a super high level for this time on the Cuban national team. Yeah. Like Yoshida's, he'll be 30 years old this year. He, he played for seven years in NPB. He was a four time all star, won back to back bat batting titles. Like, he doesn't fit the profile of a traditional amateur, you know, like before he gets to the MLB. So I think that's kind of where it's weird. I just came up with this idea. We have the Ichiro Suzuki Award, which is goes to the best player arriving from the Major League Baseball who is transferring from another league. I mean, you like it, it seems to be a different category. A rookie of the year is someone who comes up through the amateur ranks, through the minor leagues and everything, and then the transfer player of the year, and that's the Ichiro Award. I mean, it's a different category. It's That's, that's perfect. Rob Manfred, we're going to clip this and send this to your office. Yeah. Uh, we will do. I, the I literally honors just of thought of that right one. now. Yeah. Like that, it's, it, it's a different because then you put them in, a di and then it it adds almost incentivizes to have players coming in from you know the Cuban National League, from from the Korean League, mm -hmm. from the from you know the the Japanese League, the coming over there. So it's a transfer, the 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 best transfer player of the year, a player who comes in via the posting system. Therefore, as yes, okay, eligible Great. for the transfer player of the year award for the right. for the. Uh, the, the Ichiro Suzuki the Ichiro award. Suzuki Award. I love it. Uh, all right, so we're going to get to and the... And Ichiro hands it out every year because he's a smooth <laughs> dude. 
and he just he stays around baseball because he's great. Yeah. All I mean, right, that's good. That's good for baseball. We're gonna take take a quick break. When we come back, we're gonna look at the National League Player of the Year candidates on FanDuel. All right, so. We've got the American League. We know that Gunnar Henderson's the favorite, but you've got some guys in there. Obviously, Yoshida is a candidate in there. Hunter Brown of the Astros. Grayson Rodriguez, Gunnar Henderson's teammate there Volpe. in Baltimore. Vol- Anthony Volpe, the Yankees. Tristan Cassis of the Red Sox. Plenty of options there. But in the Oscar, National uh, for League... For the White Sox. Well, I want to just bring up one. You know, Oscar uh, Colas, for, is it Colas from the White Sox, who's going to have a big space open for him at first base if he makes it from a, from Abreu. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you the one person who... Uh, we'll, we'll get to the National League in just a second. I did want to say that mm-hmm. if someone's going to beat out Gunnar Henderson, it's going to be someone like Hunter Brown for this reason. That Gunnar Henderson may have some... Uh, you know, a little bit of a learning curve. You know, we're, mm-hmm. we're expecting them to come out like what I was thinking about. Has there been someone who was like the top prospect that everyone was, you know, waiting for? Did they ever, any one of them turn out to be rookie of the year? Like boom, Bryce Harper, you know, I mean, he was, I mean, At you know, age that's like 19 like, or 20. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, he was just sort of, everything was laid out for him to, and he, you know, becomes the, you know, the, the rookie of the year. Uh, and it's the same thing is being laid out, not not quite as intense for him, but but there may be a learning curve. Not everyone comes out of the gate like Bryce Harper or Mike Trout, for that matter. So Hunter Brown is going to be on an Astros team, a defending World Series team, where his stats, his win total, his run support, and everything is going to be through the roof. He's going to be protected with a really good bullpen, so he's not going to have. He's going to have some high-profile traditional stats. His peripheral stats are probably going to be very good. He already has a World Series ring. He already has a lot of the jitters out of him, mm-hmm. and that he's going to be on a team where sometimes you'll see teams like a, a rising tide. Doesn't happen as much with Rookie of the Year, but I could imagine his pitching stats being so gaudy that it overshadows, especially if Gunnar Henderson has a month or two where he needs to sort of uh, recalibrate because let's for, let's forget he's a rookie, <laughs> you know? So I, so if I were to say, if you were saying who besides Gunnar Henderson would win the national league, uh, I think Hunter Brown has a great chance to be the rookie, especially with the, the narrative of the fact that uh, Verlander left. So he's essentially going to be, oh, they didn't have to, they didn't have to worry about Verlander because Hunter Brown came right in. Just it, between this and then between last year's number one and number two in the National League, both being Braves and Michael Harris and Spencer Strider, it almost to me feels like you should separate position player and hitter, I'm sorry, and pitcher as far as rookie of the year is concerned. The National League should have two. The American League should have two. That way you can recognize both a pitcher and a position player. Because if you put two guys, at one, it's hard to compare a position player to a pitcher. But then two, so many voters tend to skew towards that everyday player in the position player versus the pitcher. So I think split these up into two awards. Let's award both Gunnar Henderson and Hunter Brown. If you're creating awards with the Ichiro Suzuki award, I'm creating awards and saying, let's do two rookie of the years. Uh, So like, that's the best way to handle it. I'm all, I'm all for handing out awards. So let's go. Let's go. Remember there used to be only one rookie of the year in all of major league baseball. Yeah. And And they they, used to be only one Cy Young award. And they they finally said, we'll do American League and National League. Right. Uh, Speaking of National League, so Rookie of the Year here, a couple options. Corbin Carroll of the Diamondbacks, the outfielder, uh, plus 350, overwhelming favorite on this. He actually got some time up last year, like a lot of the guys that we've talked about. Uh, Jordan Walker was a third baseman for the Cardinals, now a right fielder since the one Arenado announced he was staying for the rest of his contract. Uh, Jordan, that, that one's... Plus 750, a little bit tougher for me because I don't know where the playing time is going to come right away because you have so many outfit options already in don't, St. Louis. Don't worry. I, I, I always, at this point of the year, when I hear, I don't know where they're going to get at-bats, they'll get the at-bats. They'll figure some it out. Get, some will get hurt. Some will go in a slump. Don't worry. Don't worry. Depth will always work itself out. Um, right. Miguel Vargas talking about finding at-bats. Uh, plus mm-hmm. 750 for the Dodgers. He actually right now has a fractured finger. Yeah, and so, I saw that. They said he's going to be out for another week or two on swings. And then the number four option in this, Cody Singa of like like, another Japanese player coming into MLB. Well, what Um, about what where's Francisco Alvarez fit in all this? 
So he is number, he's tied for uh, for fifth on the list. It's really? Andrew Painter of the of the uh, Phillies, Ellie right. De La Cruz of the Reds, right. and Francisco Alvarez of the Mets are all tied at plus 1,200. That really surprises me. That really surprises me because I I mean, maybe I'm talking with too many Mets fans. It just seems that he has been hyped as not only uh, – a phenomenal player, but someone who is going to have a very high profile, very important job of being the Mets catcher in a year where they are basically, you know, spending money like it's the movie Brewster's Millions, trying to, you know, finally get the team the World Series title that they've been looking for since 1986, a World Series I have no memory of. And I, I'm look at, uh, I think Corbin Carroll is the front runner. Mm-hmm. And if I were to pick someone, you know, I'm I'm picking – I would pick Hunter Brown to be the AL Rookie of the Year just because I think there's so much pressure on Gunnar Henderson to be great right out of the gate. Mm-hmm. And I think that's asking too much. Um, but I'm picking Corbin Carroll just because he's so talented. He's so talented on so many different levels. And he's going to play for a Diamondbacks team where they're basically saying, all right, go ahead. You're, you know, you're our team right now. And and I think that he's going to be able to really showcase and do a lot of great things. I'm just stunned that Francisco Alvarez is that far down. I think it's something where when you look at the Mets and they go out, they sign Omar Narvaez in December. They've already yeah. got Tomas Nito. It's something where unless you assume he's he's uh, working along with Daniel Vogelback, working in at DH – there's the initial question of where does he get every day at bats? Kind of like what you referenced. I'm using, like for me, my favorite in this, I'm using the argument you used for Hunter Brown. And I'm saying Jordan Walker has such a great supporting cast around him in St. Louis. Right, he's got right. uh, Goldschmidt. He's got Aaron Nato, They just they just added the Contreras brother at catcher. So lots of offensive sources uh, of production on that team that he's not going to have to carry the team. It's a lot lower pressure situation than a Corbin Carroll, than a Gonder Henderson. And so for me, I like Jordan Walker simply because uh, they can probably win the division without him playing at all this year. And so there's not really any pressure on him when he comes up uh, to produce because obviously they have such a good team already. And it's that Hunter Brown argument again. All of his peripherals are going to be so great because you can't walk him because who's right. behind him? Nolan Arenado is behind him. Like, and, and so like I have Jordan Walker as my favorite for that reason. I'll tell you one thing I'll say about the, I'll just give one example. And this may be, um, I, you know, this may be picking the exception that uh, proves the rule. But when you say where, where is Francisco Alvarez going to play when you have these veteran catchers already with the Mets Buster Posey, when he came up with the Giants in 2010, Benji Molina was already there. Mm-hmm. And they didn't have a DH on that team. Remember, that was pre-universal DH back when baseball was a little more fun. And, sorry. Um, and, you know, Benji Molina was as respected, certainly a defensive catcher, and someone with a baseball IQ off the charts, handling a pitching staff filled with great young pitchers. And then comes Buster Posey. And by the time the World Series is there, yes, both Buster Posey and Benji Molina are in the World Series, but Molina's on the Rangers. That eventually room was made for yeah. Buster Posey. And I think that Alvarez has the opportunity to get the playing time through the DH right out of the gate. Mm-hmm. And if he shows that he is the better catcher, this Mets organization will be like, okay, this is our catcher. This is who we're going with. Um, again, I'm not picking him to win. I think this is Corbin Carroll's uh, award to to lose at this point. I completely right. understand what you're saying about Jordan Walker. I think the the position change is fantastic. It's there's so little pressure on Jordan Walker. He doesn't have to be the MVP. He doesn't have to be the second banana. He doesn't have to be the third banana. This kind of reminds me. Remember when the 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 Cleveland Indians, and they were called the Indians back then, had Jim Tomey, Eddie Murray, Albert Bell, Kenny Lofton, their fifth banana. 
was Manny Ramirez. <laughs> it's Their almost not even fair. Their banana was Carlos Bayerga. You know, and so like some of those players towards the bottom there could relax and be like, well, this, I'm not going to have to carry this team. I don't have to carry this team if they can't carry the team. So Walker, I think is, I think Walker is going to have a fantastic season in yeah. St. Louis um, because of the lack of pressure on him. But I just think Corbin Carroll is going to be, it's going to be the MVP of that team. I think. Yeah. We will definitely get back together right after midseason and kind of see how our, our predictions here are doing. Uh, Sully, where can, where can my listeners Well, I just want to say to, one last thing. Yeah, yeah, one of the great yeah. things that happens every year is that there will be a player who is going to contribute. Who, Out of nowhere. We're going like, no one saw this coming. Nobody saw this player coming up. And out of the blue wins five straight games out of the rotation. Or Yuri Perez play. of the Marlins. Right. I mean, like, you don't know that. And they, there will be someone who will solidify the bullpen. Like, no one saw this. Or an injury came down. I'll never forget when in the, when the Giants had – I think I started four games for the Giants in 2014 at second base. It was when Marco Scudero got hurt. And they tried everybody, 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 including Dan Ugla at second base. And then they brought in Joe Panic. And a bunch of us were saying, how appropriate is it that the Giants are using a guy named Panic in this position, which they can't find a, a, a player on? And Panic solidified the middle of that. I'm not saying Panic became the MVP or the Rookie of the Year or anything like that. That was 2014, and, uh, and uh, Jacob deGrom was the Rookie of the Year that year. But if you polled 10 million people and said, what young rookie do you think is going to help the Giants win a World Series this year? I don't think Joe Panic would be on anybody's list. But that's one of the things that happens every year. And it's a magical thing when the Randy Rosarenas become a playoff hero or someone comes out of the blue, like Aaron Small basically saving the Yankees season in 2005. Those are the great things when they happen. You just you just sit back and go like, wow, this was – I mean, look at look at last year's uh, – the, the, the rookie of the year voting of last year, okay? You had um, – Obviously, uh, uh, you know, Julio Rodriguez won the, uh, you know, won the rookie of the year and deservedly so. Wire but, and wire, you know, yeah. You know, but I mean, you saw people like, you know, uh, you know, who's, there was, the, there was, uh, you know, George Kirby wasn't on a lot of people's short lists for a rookie to help contribute on a big scale to go in the postseason, you know, and you saw how people worried about, you know, uh, or Stephen Kwan coming up and becoming a huge part of Cleveland getting back and getting all the way to the division series, almost being really a few innings away from being going to the league championship series. Mm -hmm. Who had Stephen Kwan on their list? Show me. I want to see it. And I want to see that notarized and dated for when you made that prediction. And when we get back together in, you know, around the all-star break and do kind of a recap, we're going to be saying, man, Nobody saw insert players who is now beloved by fan base here. And it's going to be. Nobody saw thing. Ken Waldachuk of Oakland being the no. rookie of the year favorite. Yeah. It's, no. it's that's going to be what it's, happens. And it's that's the be beauty happening. of I think, this. And it's, and it's the, I think one of the magical things about baseball. That is the beauty of baseball. Uh, mm -hmm. Sully, if, if, if listeners of locked on MLB prospects want more of you and, and what you do, where can they go to find that? Well, uh, follow, if you want to listen to the show, uh, subscribe to Locked On MLB wherever you get your podcasts or subscribe to the YouTube channel. You could follow me at Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. I'm hard at work on what I do every year, which is the In Memoriam video, which I do at the beginning of each year where I, we pay tribute to some of the great people who we've lost, not just in the major leagues, but uh, for you know in other leagues and other people. I try my best to, to, capture, you know, to cast a wide net. Obviously, I'm not going to have every name in it. But there are some big ones this year. Um, certainly, we just lost Tim McCarver. Hall of Famers like Gaylord Perry and Bruce Souter. Uh, Vince Scully is going to be in that one as well. Uh, and some other pioneers and other people who were front office people and some people who were 
um, you know, fan favorites, the Bill Campbells and the Chucky Cars of the world are going to be in there as well. So I'm hard at work at editing that. So I'll be ready before opening day. And, uh, and it's always good for pulling a few heartstrings and, and making us have a moment. We can tip our caps to those who are no longer with us, but whose impact on the game is going to continue for a long, long time. Just think, uh, this year in heaven, the world series will be announced by Vince Scully and Tim McCarver. That's not a bad combo up there. Not a bad combo up there at all. No. Uh, for- and Lindsay, for those of you who don't who are listening on the Locked On MLB feed, why don't you tell people where you're what you're all about? I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. My show, Locked On MLB Prospects, available wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube. You can find us on Twitter at Locked On Farm, and then send your questions in. We have mailbags every single Monday, entirely from listener questions so send them to me on twitter send them to the show on twitter or email us locked in mlb prospects at gmail.com yeah i mean fans of my show i mean listen Lindsay crosby he's an encyclopedia of baseball prospects so he's going deep on the mlb stars tomorrow so just just listen wherever you get your podcast well doing a crossover here locked on mlb locked on mlb prospects i am your host paul francis sullivan Right there, that's Lindsey Crosby. Feel free to call me Sully. And do you know what? While you're at it, call him Sully too. 